All right. So the fungi case study, which kind of gives away what she's infected with, right? But <laughs> so the short version: girl decides to be wild and get a tattoo, right? Um, the bad news is is that it gets infected, and it's not her fault. It actually got infected from the ink, right, at the tattoo parlor. But she goes to the health center, right, because she's clearly, it's it's more than just the usual reaction you have to the fact that you created a lot of trauma in your skin by getting a tattoo. So she goes, right, and she's experiencing some symptoms. And at first, they're thinking it may be allergy, right? Maybe she's allergic to the dyes that they inject into her skin, which is possible, right? So she's dealing with edema swelling. Do you get this with an allergic reaction? Yeah, you can get this with an allergic reaction. My animation is messed up. <laughs> so what for? The edema, the heat, and, and and what is edema, swelling, and heat usually contributed to? Inflammation, right? So erythema, which is another name for redness. Again, this is all inflammation, right? This is an immune response. Whether it's allergy, which is a, you know, a needed response, or is it infection? You really can't tell the difference sometimes. So increased swelling later on, right? So she's got those initial symptoms, and then later on she's got increased swelling. She's hot. She's itchy. She's red. Which one of these is not actually a sign but is in fact what we call a symptom and that is itchy. So what are the differences? Signs are something you can see and measure, right? The doctor can look at you and see swelling, can touch you and feel heat, right? Even take your temperature possibly and realize you are experiencing fever. Redness, erythema, you can see this, right? Can you tell that somebody is itchy? No, they have to tell you. What's something else they'd have to tell you that the doctor would not be able to see? Well, hot you could measure. You could measure. Pain. Pain, right? You go to the doctor, you say you have a headache. He has to take your word for it. He has no way of measuring this, right? Veterinarians only die, deal with signs, things they can see and measure. Dr. Doolittle isn't real, right? There are no animals talking to veterinarians. There's nobody complaining about any pains, upset stomach, being itchy other than seeing them scratch, right? That would be a pretty good indicator. You can maybe sense that they might be in pain but you wouldn't necessarily know for sure. When I was in college, we had this horse we called Hocus Pocus. We put her in the beginning riding classes. He didn't like them too much. Beginner riders are kind of annoying, right? They don't quite know what they're doing. And so he got really annoyed. So he developed this limp. The veterinarian came and I mean numbed this whole horse's leg. I mean, there's no way he's feeling pain. Still limping. I'm like, well, don't know what's wrong with him. Something's wrong with him. Stick him out in the rest paddock. Next day, he's running laps in the rest paddock. No limping, no nothing. Totally fine. Put him in the upper level classes. Happy as can be. They need him to sub in one of the lower level classes. All of a sudden, he starts limping again. He's faking an injury. The horse was faking an injury, y'all to get out of being in the beginner level riding classes. So, you know, you can assume these things sometimes, right? But you don't really truly know um, until you investigate further. So a lot of times sign and symptoms get lumped together, but there is a distinction. Um, 
When we're truly talking about signs, they're things you can see and measure. Symptoms are something that you can only really feel, right, and express. Um, and we're not going to be able to measure or see these things happening. And that's, and that's mostly with pain, right? So most of these signs are common with inflammation, which you get with an immunological response, right? So, but why is the immune system responding? Do we have infection? Or is it responding to something foreign that won't actually cause an infection, but the immune system is responding to, right, in the case of allergy? So... There's my definitions, right? So a symptom is a subjective evidence of a disease, while a sign is objective evidence. So symptoms are phenomenons that are experienced, right? Individuals affected by disease, while a sign is a phenomenon that can be detected by someone other than the individual affected by the disease. It's something we can actually see, someone else can actually see or measure. So, which one is actually just a symptom? And that is the itchy. And, again, when some people are experiencing allergy, they are itchy. And, again, it's because the Im immune response. But even with infection, again, you could experience itching, right? It's not something that's synonymous with allergy or infection. So, what is inflammation? You guys know this. It's immune cells heading to the area, right? And, in, and it's heading through your blood, so your blood vessels become leaky, and you get that swelling into the area. What's the purpose? Why do we want white blood cells going there? One at a time. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Stop the invaders. Someone's going to say something a different way? No? You're going to say the same thing? What were you going to say in the bank? You were going to say something, no, for inflammation? Casey, no? Oh, no? No, no, okay. So we're going to stop the invaders. We want to contain the invaders, right? We, we, we want to keep stuff in a particular area. So it's a protective tissue response to injury, right, or destruction of tissue, which happens when they do a tattoo, right? They're literally causing wounds in your skin, injecting dye into your skin. What's the purpose, right? We want to destroy or dilute, right, wall them off, keep them from getting to the rest of the body. Could inflammation be the result of an infection caused by a pathogen and not an allergic reaction? Absolutely, right? That's our normal immunological response. Could it be both? Yeah, she could be having allergy and infection. You could have both at the same time. So they prescribe Benadryl. How the heck does Benadryl work? Well, Benadryl is the trademark name, the generic or chemical name. I'm not even going to uh, begin to try to pronounce, right? You're going you're gonna to pronounce it for me, Kyle? Diphahydramine. Yeah, that's a tongue twister for you. It's an antihistamine, right? It's that class of drugs. So histamine is released and binds to receptors on cells, usually during an allergic reaction. But this will happen, too, with other types of immunological reactions. But it happens more often with allergic reactions, which is why we take antihistamines, right? Because histamine is a major player in allergic reactions. So the antihistamine in Benadryl compete with the histamines for the cell receptor. So here you've got histamine, our normal produced histamine. We want it to bind to those receptors and cause the cells to do something. In this case, uh, an inflammatory response. If antihistamine binds to it first or outcompetes the histamine and it doesn't trigger that response from the cells, you get a shutdown in that system. Right? So we're kind of tricking the system. So when we say anti, it's not necessarily destroying histamine. It's competing, actually, with histamine. And so this is why, again, it's beneficial if you know you're allergic to something to take the antihistamine ahead of time. 
So you have it in the system. So when your system releases histamine, it's having to outcompete the antihistamine that's already there. Right. And this is why, like, you know, when, when you already have an allergic reaction and you take your allergy medicine, it seems like it isn't working. Well, because it can't, right? It's going to take time. It's got to compete. And it's really going to stop prior, it's going to stop subsequent exposures, not that primary exposure, right? You're going to wait for your body to deal with the fact that the floodgates have already opened. And we got to figure out how we can get them closed again. Histamine, antihistamines don't help with that. They help with the, the flood con gates continually opening and opening and opening and no stop in sight. Make sense? Okay, so, um, and again, the, the antihistamine doesn't cause the reaction the histamine does for our cells when it binds. So we, we, we get that stoppage of the reaction. The interesting about this particular drug is also known to cause draw drowsiness because it also blocks acetylcholine, right? and acts as a sedative. So you'll actually notice too, when I was having trouble sleeping a while back, <laughs> I went to the drugstore and I was like, I'm just gonna buy me a sleep aid. And I'm one of the ones that actually reads the chemicals that are in what I'm buying, right? And guess what chemical I saw? This one. Yeah, I was like, oh, they're basically just giving you Benadryl. Most of the over-the-counter sleep aids are just Benadryl. <coughs> Save yourself a couple of bucks if Benadryl works and buy the good old generic Benadryl. Now, granted, they have other stuff added to it that's supposed to help and stuff like that. For me, Benadryl does not work at all as a sedative, at all. So that would have been a complete waste of my money had I purchased those sleep aids, thinking they were going to help me. So it did nothing. Yeah, melatonin, other things, right? Turns out my CPAP machine was off, and that was not what the problem was. <laughs> so, <laughs> I fixed that, sort I have of. A question about using this in the sleep aid. It's like the place I work, it, they give this a lot to patients to help them sleep. Mm -hmm. But isn't that bad? Like if you actually do need your histamine to work, and you're using it as a sleep aid, right? Like the same uh, way, like, but like, also, the, again, it doesn't have a long acting period. Okay. So it it does wear off. And, and it depends on how much you're taking, too. So, yeah. And it's not the only, um, see, you know how there's other allergy medicines out there? There's different types of histamine, and different types of receptors. It's much more complicated than what we're explaining here. So there are other things. Your immune system can still work in other ways when you suppress this one avenue. So you're not necessarily suppressing their immune system and leaving them susceptible. Good question, though. Good thinking. I've thought about that before. Yeah. So <laughs> even in this explanation, right, histamine, what does it do, right? It induces capillary dilation. Um, it increases uh, capillary permeability, lowers blood pressure, right, because everything's leaking out of the blood vessels. Um, it causes contraction of smooth muscles. It'll actually increase gastric acid production and secretion and acceleration of heart rate. It's also a mediator, and again, it depends on where these things are being released and whether the receptors are there for these things to happen, right? Um, it's also a mediator of what we call hypersensitivity, another thing, another name for allergy, allergic response, right? And in hyper, right, it's an over-response to something it shouldn't necessarily be responding to. Um, so there's three types of cellular receptors of histamine. Type 1 receptors mediate the contraction of the smooth muscle and capillary dilation. Um, and that's the main one that um, histamine, uh, antihistamines are triggering uh, the stoppage of. Um, the receptors that H2 receptors mediate the acceleration of heart rate and promotion of gastric um, secretion. Both type 1 and type 2 receptors mediate the contraction of smooth muscle, uh, vascular smooth muscle. Type 3 receptors are believed to play a role in the regulation and release of histamine and other neurotransmitters from neurons. So, again, it's much more complicated um, than just simple, you know, blocking just, um, when you're blocking histamine, you're not blocking all of its abilities. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So, what does, where does histamine come from? 
right? So where does this substance come from? It's released from the granules of mast cells. And, and you know, that's, those are the ones in our, in our um, tissues. And they're going to be stimulated by an antigen binding, again, to those IgEs on the surface or to an allergen, right? Something that we, you know, wouldn't naturally hurt us, but our immune system is recognizing it's foreign and potentially dangerous. So where are they found in our body? In our tissues, right? All throughout our body. They reside in our mucosal and epithelial tissues near small blood vessels, so hence they can affect those small blood vessels and post-capillary venules. They're also in the subendothelial connective tissue. So, you know, all guarding the, the entry, right, into the body. So, centripetal pattern, what does that mean? Kyle, you know that one? Yeah. Yeah, centered. So, it's an inward pattern of spread. So, where it begins at the extremities, but then it's heading towards the center of your body. Right? And this is usually an, an issue, right? You don't want things traveling. Right? So if she has this wound on her arm, but then they're noticing, that, right, that there is inflammation traveling up. Usually if you have an allergic reaction, if that's where the allergen is and that's where the allergen stays, that's where the inflammation is going to stay. Right? If you've got something traveling, something is moving from that area. Right? And the body is responding to it. So, right, so this is, this is, this is a... This is like, oh, this is a kind of red flag thing, right? Something else might be going on here. So finally, when she goes to the hospital, right, the doctor is noticing that particular pattern, right, that it's spreading towards the body. So he doesn't know quite what's going on, right? So he gives an anti-inflammatory. Why is he giving an anti-inflammatory? Stop inflammation. Why would you want to stop inflammation? That's our normal, normal body response to invasion, right? But in this case, it's been going on for a long time, and it hasn't been successful, right? So it may be creating more damage than it is helpful. That's why. At this point, it's prolonged. It may not be helping. He, he prescribes a different antihistamine. What is he thinking here? Right, like the other antihistamine isn't working, so maybe a different one may work, right? So, and again, maybe thinking maybe it might still be allergy, so we're going to cover that base too, right? We're just going to try a different antihistamine. Right? So not, as we said, not all histamines work in the same way. Right? So we're going to try a different one. We're going to prescribe a broad-spectrum antibiotic. What's broad-spectrum mean? Kill lots of stuff. Right? We're just, I mean, we're just sending the whole barrage in there. Right? What type of infections do we use, do we fight with antibiotics typically? bacterial infections, right? So he's thinking it might be a bacterial infection, right? Let's give her some antibiotics. Then he's going to go one step further, right? So, I mean, he's trying to make her comfortable in the meantime, but he's like, i got to get to the root of the problem. And it's in her skin, right? So we got to take some samples. So why look at it under the microscope? You might see some bacteria, right? You might see the pathogen, right, if we look at it under the microscope. But, so determine if an organism is the cause, right? Can we see something there? And then he also sends it for culture, I believe. So we don't talk about right here, skin savings. Oh, and culture, right? So he's going to try and grow anything that may be in these skin scrapings. Um, she could be having an allergic reaction, but the doctor also needs to rule out any other problem like infection with a pathogen, right? So that's why all these different avenues. 
So upon learning of her case, right, and the fact that she got a tattoo done, there are certain things that have to be done to help prevent the likelihood of infection, right, when, when someone gets tattooed. It's highly regulated, so the health department gets sent out, and of course the shop owner is annoyed, right? He's like, I'm following regulations, it's not my fault, right? They find some mouse traps in the area, it gets real interesting. So the tattoo process, right, they're injecting a dye into your skin with a needle. So the needle needs to be sterile, right? The, the inks that they're using need to be sterile. They need to clean your skin significantly. You need to clean and keep it clean after this procedure because you have a wound, right? Um, so it's very important that this is done very cleanly, right? And again, you know, um, this is why to a certain extent, right, the individual is kind of annoyed because they thought they had done everything they were supposed to come to find out not the case. So after 48 hours um, of her cultures growing, it grew only normal skin flora, right? Stuff that would normally be found on her skin anyways. Things like gram-positive cosci and clusters, we refer to that as what? Staphylococci, right? So like Staphylococcus epididymis could have been there, right? I don't see it in this picture. I have to say they did a poor job in the picture. Because <laughs> I see some rods here, right? But I don't see any cocci in clusters. So I don't know what they were expecting us to see. And they said thin-walled uh, fungal hyphae. And again, you do have yeast and fungi associated normally with your skin. So that might just be the normal stuff that's there and not actually an infection. And when we talk about bacteria, you expect antibiotics to take care of, especially if you're using a broad spectrum one that should take care of lots of different types of bacteria. And in fact, she's even more inflamed, right? The sites are cracking. Topical antibiotic ointments were applied to prevent secondary infection, but it's, it's just not working, right? So are we surprised to see staphylococci? No, we know that these are normal skin flora. Right? We also know that fungi can be present on the skin. Right? This isn't unusual. Two types of fungi that are common to the skin are can albicans, Canada albicans. And sometimes this one can overgrow, especially for women, and cause what we typically refer to as a yeast infection. Um, uh, another one you'll see is Melissizia fervor which can cause a condition referred to as versicolor. And the reason for this is when it overgrows in the skin, for Caucasian individuals, it will tend to cause pigmentation in the area. For African American individuals, it decreases pigmentation in the area. So you have a loss of color. So versicolor, this opposite in color of the normal skin tone because of the growth of this fungus. And again, this is, this is abnormal conditions when it overgrows, right? It can cause these disease conditions. So Melissa's Aferza is an um, atherophilic fungus that belongs to the physiological skin flora, right? It's normally found on skin. The fungus can grow in a yeast phase as well as in the mycelium phase where they stretch out, right, the long hyphae. On non-infected skin, the fungus is mainly present in the yeast phase. The organism has complex lipid requirements for growth, which also explains its occurrence on skin, right? Because we have very fatty um, source of lipids. Lipids are fatty-like substances. It can also lead um, to the requirement for specially supplemented media for cultivating it. So if we're trying to grow it in the lab, just standard old media that we use to grow bacteria won't work, right? You have to make sure you provide the correct nutrients, those lipids, for it to actually grow. Um, and as I said, it can cause a condition referred to as versicolor when it does overgrow. And typically it's individuals that are having other types of immunological issues um, or um, conditions that are allowing this overgrowth to happen. So Canada albicans, as I said, is um, normal too to um, our skin. 
uh, for most people, but older overgrowths can occur, um, can happen in the mouth. We typically refer to this condition as thrush. Um, it can happen in the vagina, uh, and women, unfortunately, most women, about 85% of women, experiences one time or another in their lifetime, unfortunately. Um, and this is usually um, due to a disruption of the normal flora. The bacteria that usually keep the yeast in check are usually disrupted either by antibiotics or hormonal cycles or other issues going on, and then the yeast overgrow, and, and it's a very uncomfortable um, situation. It can even get into the body, and the bad news with that is it can produce toxins that can spread through the bloodstream and cause um, pretty serious conditions for people's immune system, with people with compromised immune systems, especially HIV patients, babies, elderly, um, and some patients going through chemotherapy. So our own fungi that are normally present, right, can really be a source of a really big problem um, if it gets where it's not supposed to go or if it grows to levels that it shouldn't. But again, on skin and mucous membranes. So fungal hyphae were also noted upon uh, direct detection under the microscope. Again, we, we don't, this is not necessarily uncommon. Right? It's not uncommon to have fungi on your skin without causing an illness. A day later, all of the cultures um, from the ink salon swabs were negative for growth. At the physician's request, the health department investigators returned to the salon to culture the different inks used in generating Megan's tattoo. At this time, one investigator noticed a mouse trap and asked the owner about it. And the owner was located on the first floor of a downtown commercial building that a com a, uh, yeah. accommodated a, na a, a neighboring restaurant in multiple upstairs apartments. The owner blamed his minor mouse infestation on his neighbors. He was instructed to call the health department immediately upon catching the mouse. Now, why is a mouse in the house a problem? Because they can carry disease, right? They can carry bacteria, they can carry viruses. In this case, fungi, right? And so one week later, the lab rep uh, began reporting some interesting results. Megan's scrapings inoculated on notice as a special type of media, uh, sorbitol dextrose agar. This is for growing fungi. Right. Um, so again, you know, they're like, okay, let's just make sure that this is normal fungi and not, you know, the normal stuff present when they saw it under the microscope. So in fact, they did find a particular species of fungi that is not part of the normal flora. And the orthospores were found in the ink, right? So this is how it got to her skin. But the question, too, is how did it get into the ink from the mice, right? So what are the features of this microbe, this, this fungus? Um, what stains are frequently used? And how are the orthospods live in the ink? So why do we stain organisms to look at them under the microscope? Right, create contrast so that we can see them. Where is this organism typically found? Right, it's, it's actually found on um, rodents like mice. So having seen that mouse trap in the presence of mice um, is a real indicator of where it may have potentially come from. What does it look like? Um, and so it looks like mold looks like, right? Fuzzy when it grows on um, culture, and I have some pictures. What are author spars? These are spores, and so this is actually not a, a, a reproducing, not an actively metabolizing. This is something that can reproduce into the fungi. So this is a resting state of the fungus. So it's not actually growing in the ink. It's just present in the ink. When it's injected into her arm is when it's allowed to grow because then now nutrients are available. But it wasn't destroyed by the ink because it's in a resting stage. And so again, they're, they're, they're meant to, other spars are for them to survive for long periods of time 
without any nutrients. So that's why it's, it's, it's survived, it's still viable in the ink. So typically they use uh, particular types of dyes um, that are blue dyes to be able to actually stain and look at the organism under the microscope. And that's where you would see these long threads and these little oval-like cells. So where does it come from? It's zoophilic, which means that mostly you're going to find it in animals, but it can infect humans. So again, mice, uh, other rodents like guinea pigs, kangaroos actually, I thought that one was interesting, cats, sheep, rabbits, all have the ability to carry this fungus. And then so this is what it would look like, right, just like a mold does fuzzy on that uh, auger plate, kind of cream colored. The arthrospores are asexual spores. Um, they're released by fragmentation or segmentation from other cells forming those long threads we call hyphae. Usually have really thick cell walls and this is what's going to help protect them in a harsh environment like being in the ink. So these are designed for dispersal, right? So they'll go into the environment and then land and hopefully at some point food will become available. So why is Megan demonstrating a hypersensitivity symptom if she has a fungal infection? Well, hypersensitivity is a state of altered reaction in which the body reacts with an aggressive immune response to a perceived foreign substance, right? So again, the body thinks, right, that when you have allergy, that it's a foreign substance and it really thinks it's something that, that could hurt you. So it responds quite aggressively. So does your body when you actually have something foreign that could hurt you. So again, you know, it's, it's not that whenever you have a reaction that it could be allergy, it could be infection, or it could be both. Your immune system pretty much responds the same way to infection and allergy. It's an immunological response. So since it is, though, so infections can sometimes appear to be hypersensitivities because both are going to cause an immune response. The difference is the cause of the response. An allergen won't actually hurt you. A pathogen will. So he prescribes a particular drug. Um, this drug um, binds to a protein called keratin as it forms in our cells, right? This forms in our nail bed, in our hair, and in our skin. It does not kill fungal infections that are established in these areas, but instead it's going to prevent the fungal cells from spreading. And the good thing about your skin is you're always shedding these cells, right? So as you're shedding these cells, the so are the fungi going to be eliminated. But what we're stopping them from doing is continuing to grow because they're no longer going to be able to access the keratin that they're eating um, because this drug is going to make it not available to them. So they're not going to be able to continue to multiply and grow. They're eventually going to die off because the food source is no longer going to be available to them, right? And they'll be shed off with the dead flaking cells. So EpiLink. What does that mean? This epidemiologist studied this, right? They studied where did it come from? How did it get there, right? So it was probably epidemiologists, in truth, that did the investigation, right, for this particular case. So for this case, right, where did it all begin? The mouse in the house, who probably walked over the ink, right? exposed the ink, the ink was injected into Megan, containing these arthrospores, they germinated and caused this infection for her. And the good news is hopefully, right, they're able to clean up their act and not do this to someone else. 
And the poor girl, the rest of the story is, I think she ended up having have part of the, it removed. It was so distorted, right, and messed up. Um, probably based on true stories. I don't see why not. Um, but I don't know that it truly happened. But it very well could have happened. All right. So this one fit in well for today, too. <laughs> I didn't even realize it. I picked a good one for today. <laughs>